Warning, there are offensive words in this podcast. Also, defensive words. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by movement and by sitting still. We kind of get them both ends of the spectrum this week. And now, The Scathing Atheist. This is Kevin from the Not Your Grandmother's Book Club podcast. And having now read books by Dinesh D'Souza, Donald Trump Jr., Ben Shapiro, and the incomparable Glenn Beck... I can assure you that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men. It's Thursday. It's December 16th. And it's National Chocolate Covered Anything Day. All right. I feel like you're going to make him regret that title. <laughs> no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Jared Kushner's New Jersey, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, Fox News finds a flash of persecution on their Christmas tree. The Christian right is so goddamn inept, they can't even hate Dr. Oz correctly. And Eli will send a picture of his chocolate-covered butthole to a stranger for a different reason than last week. (laughs) But first, the diatribe. Imagine having the audacity to think that you could gatekeep joy. I mean, there is a war on Christmas, right? There is an organized effort to suck all the fun out of it, undermine its meaning, and winnow down its cultural importance until it's a non-event. But the side doing all that shit is the Christian side. I mean, we talk a lot about the pagan origins of Christmas, and, and rightly we should. like The trees, the lights, the mistletoe, the gift-giving, the emphasis on joy and altruism, all of that shit predates the hostile Christian takeover. But there's also a huge chunk of shit on the other side that they want to nab the credit for, too. Like, for example, the fact that it's popular. I mean, they bitch and moan every chance they get about how corporations have commercialized Christmas and turned it into nothing but a marketing opportunity. But so the fuck what? That's what makes it awesome. The marketeers have done such a good job with your holiday that Jews had to bring a holiday up from the minor leagues just to satiate their kids. You motherfuckers should be thanking them, not condemning them. Consider what Christmas really is. And and I don't just mean the modern American version. I mean the celebration itself throughout all time and across all nations. Right? Even if you set aside the pagan holidays that predated it, that, that means that along with the mall Santas and Whamageddon, we have to add Krampus and Icelandic murder cats and the candy pooping sacrificial log from Spain. But on top of all of that, you have to tack on puritanical regimes that forbade Christmas celebrations. And the centuries upon centuries where it was just a public feast and a convenient theme for that week's sermon. And when you do that, what are you left with? What, what, what is the universal thing about Christmas? Presents? Obviously not. Those are, if anything, an on-again, off-again extravagance, historically speaking. Is it celebrating Jesus? Well, the fact that I've got a fucking tree full of presents downstairs disproves that assertion. Well, surely the date is universal, right? Well, unless, of course, you're Eastern Orthodox, in which case you celebrate it on January 7th. Hell, even the name falls short of universality since, you know, not everybody speaks English. So in reality, Christmas is a category rather than an individual thing. This wasn't always the case. I I, I mean, I guess it was to some degree, but, but there was a time when the Catholic Church had a damn near iron grip on this holiday for most of the Christian world. And back then it was a more or less uniform celebration, or at least far more so than it is now. And also, and for the same reason, a much more boring holiday. And then in the relatively recent past, and we're talking really the last hundred years, marketers got a hold of it. And then a relatively boring feast day with better than average iconography became the holiday that every other celebration was measured by. Commercialization turned it into a holiday other religions were literally jealous of. It didn't get there through nativity scenes and candles. That shit was already there. It didn't get there through joy or happiness. Every holiday has that shit. It, it, it got there through a relentless, shameless, rapacious focus on consumerism. I mean, knock the free market all you want, but it makes for better holidays than religion does. You know, the parts that people responded to became ever more important and the parts they don't like get pushed to the back of the line. And the parts people don't like are all the religious bullshit. Now, Christians can blame profiteering for taking the Christ out of Christmas all they want, but 
you can't have the one without the other. If it weren't for all the commercialization, there'd be nothing to fight over. Nobody puts out banners for Lent reminding people that penitence is the reason for the season or screams about how we got to keep John the Baptist in epiphany. Left to their own devices, religions make boring ass holidays completely lacking in any meaningful tradition and any cartoon mascots. But you give Madison Avenue a month. And they'll make the fucking feast of St. Francis of Assisi into some kid's cross days off a calendar's over. If you give it any real thought, you realize that Christianity should be sucking marketing's dick for what they did for Christmas. Taking the Christ out of it was the best thing that ever happened to the damn day. But of course, Christians can't acknowledge any of that while still taking credit for all the good parts of the holiday. So the marketers get quite the opposite of thanks. Look, a sign that says Jesus is the reason for the season is an admission of guilt. Even if it was true, which it quite demonstrably is not, it's a little like a director going to the theater to watch his own movie, then standing up in the middle of it and demanding that everybody acknowledge that they'd never get to watch that movie if it wasn't for him. So fucking what? Who fucking cares? If Dave Smith right, was the reason for the season. I feel like he'd be humble enough not to have to make any signs declaring it. But the fucking king of kings, the prince of peace is too fragile to just let a motherfucker enjoy the party. So, yeah, I guess technically there is a war on Christmas, but the dreaded secular humanists have nothing to do with it. It's a war Christians are losing to themselves. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the New York and New Jersey to Mike Connecticut, Heath Enright, and Eli Bosnick. <laughs> Fellas, are you ready to give the headlines a try? Fantastic. No, State area. And <laughs> New York <laughs> at all. <laughs> I, I let you be the New York. Damn it. In our lead story tonight, we're going to have Andrew on a little later to talk about yet another step in the Christian nationalists' mad scramble for legal dispensation. But I think it's important to contextualize that up front by reminding everybody what a precipitous drop religiosity in America has been taking over the last few decades. Like, after all, Christians aren't seizing ever more power despite the nation's decreasing religiosity, but because of it. They see the writing on the wall, and they know that a previously impenetrable privilege is starting to show some wear, so they're basically doing the judicial equivalent of stealing everything that isn't nailed down before they're evicted. And to emphasize that, I have a little more of the aforementioned wall writing in the form of a new report from the Pew Research Center that shows the demographic free fall of Christianity is showing no signs of abating with a record 29 percent of Americans reporting no religious affiliation. Yeah. And now the Christian right is in a panic and everything they couldn't steal because it was nailed down. Like you said, they're peeing on it now yep. and licking it. <laughs> yes. In that order. <laughs> and as much as I enjoy the image of, you know, Brett Kavanaugh being peed on that, <laughs> that I have a tab for that, but this is overall bad despite that great image. Yeah. And let's keep in mind that that number is just the honest people, right? right. That, that doesn't count the people who check the box marked whatever I was born, like, dead grandma's gonna check their work well yes exactly we'll get a little more to that later but so yeah the opening sentence of the report is quote the secularizing shifts evident in american society so far in the 21st century show no signs of slowing end quote so now, for context here keep in mind that when we started this show we were celebrating the fact that the percentage of non-religious americans had skyrocketed all the way up to almost 23 percent so like, this is an increase of some 14 million non-religious Americans. All right. Well, that's math, and it's all thanks to podcasting. You're all welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It just, with those numbers, it really feels like we should get our own tax-free buildings. Uh, Guys, are we sure we don't want to start a church of scatheism and abuse the system just a weensy bit? Yes. Just a weensy? No. You're <laughs> not sure. <laughs> well, I think we should do that. I think we should do that. No, but so that's the that's not the only good news we got, though. At the same time that fewer and fewer people are identifying as Christians, the ones who are wearing that label are taking it ever less seriously. So like the number of people who say that they pray daily has also been declining and is now all the hell way down to 45 percent. So it was, a significant number there, almost 20% of Americans believe there's an omnipotent being that loves them and could do them favors anytime they call upon them. They just, <laughs> they just don't. But they don't do that yet. <laughs> Seems legit. It's bootstraps, gumption, America. They're doing it themselves. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Job creators. You're right. Back to blue. <laughs> 
Also, the survey asked people how important religion is to them, and only 41% answered very. That's down from like well over 50 as recently as 2015. The number in the not very, not at all category, which was presented together in this report, is all the hell way up to 33%. Okay, then, like, why are they doing it are they fans of losing their sunday mornings I'm well <laughs> let's let's not mistake christian for churchgoer right the the number that for the first time ever we saw a survey a couple of weeks ago that said that church membership is down below half in the country of course it, just like the last 23 of these surveys that we've talked about on the show i should emphasize that this does not equal a rise in self-identified atheists cowards uh, even if it does mean a rise in de facto <laughs> atheists at least so atheists make up about four percent of the population and agnostics are another five percent those numbers have been more or less steady for like five years now now in, in a sense that's pretty good considering that i've read about 600 obituaries for atheism in that time and it's a huge fucking number when you consider all the non-christian religions combined also only account for like six percent of the population but we're still working hard to shift a few more of those nuns into identifying as atheists. Unfortunately, a lot of prominent atheists seem to be working equally hard in the opposite direction. So, yeah, which is why from now on, we here at Scathing Atheists would appreciate it if you all would start referring to us as the new atheist nope, leadership. No, nope. nope. you got kicked out of a safe way today for putting grapes down your pants today. Yes, but I did it non-transphobically. Atheist okay. leadership. That's, All right, that's better. You are qualified. In that sense. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Atheist leadership. And in Canadian gay can news. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> gay can. Yikes. Just do your story. There you go. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm scrolling through the story choices week to week, I think about the parallel universe where our podcast is based in Canada. I own plaid shirts and a wood chopping axe. Lucinda what? has a French accent instead of a southern one. And way more often than in this universe, we get to report on good news, which is the case once again this week, as we're pleased to announce that Canadian government has finally passed a bill banning conversion therapy. <laughs> so, OK, so first of all, that. That accent is not French. It's French Canadian. Totally different thing. <laughs> but secondly, how sad is it that the closest we get to good news in our line of work is like bad news not happening anymore? Right? That <laughs> is what it is, I guess. Yeah. Also, I don't think you should have an axe. I, I think that's a mistake. <laughs> I think there's I there's a lot of comedy in, in me that parallel an axe. universe. If you're listening, parallel universe, take that axe away, real quick. Maybe a cricket bat. What? We'll talk about it. <laughs> Right. So for those of you unfamiliar, anti-gay conversion therapy, sometimes called affirming therapy, Christian counseling and ex-gay ministry is uh, torturing people till they pretend that they're straight. Yep. Now, sometimes it's just psychological torture and lying. But those are the, the good examples. Yeah. Yeah. It, it also used to include like electroshock therapy and physical torture when it was more mainstream and accepted. And I don't think we have to say this, but it doesn't fucking work because you can't choose your sexuality. Right. Because if you could, he would be gay. Oh, God, that'd be awesome. Right. Just broing out with my dudes, fucking broing out some more of the best. Right. I mean, oh. you'd still bro out with your dudes, then fuck, then bro out. I mean, like that, like broing out with your dudes is literally your job. So you don't, <laughs> we don't fuck, though. No, we don't fuck. No. I've always said I bring that up every meeting. <laughs> <like it's laughs> <shut down. laughs> So do I. <laughs> exactly. So while there have been strides against this practice in the U.S. in the recent past, almost all of them have religious exemptions, which kind of defeats the point. Yeah. And it's worth pointing out that that's not the case with Bill CB4. Quote, Bill CB4 proposes to outright prohibit both adults and children from being subjected to harmful conversion therapy practices through four new criminal code offenses, including making it a crime punishable by up to five years in prison to cause another person to undergo conversion therapy. Oh, wow. End quote. Wow. Yeah. Well, so that, that's another way it's superior to anything that we've done here, though. Like, pretty much universally, our bans are restricted to kids, right? Like, uh, uh, American adults apparently have a unalienable right to voluntarily subject themselves to torture, like, even if they're psychologically tortured into doing it. Yeah. No, yep. that's important. And then it wouldn't really be the voluntarily. 
George Washington really cared about that. Mm -hmm. And of course, (laughs) as a result of all this not being able to yell gay kids straight, the Christian Post has dubbed Canada an anti-Christian nation for this. Jesus. I mean, yeah. For this. And then the other piece of evidence they added was their pandemic restrictions. <laughs> so you're saying we can't torture and we can't kill people. What can we do? <laughs> what, what are we allowed to do as a Christian? What's the point of even having a religion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So obviously great news for Canadians. And of course, for Heath, who is still really hoping that Canadian fiance he made up turns out to be real. It's so, not made up. It's a real thing. Check the. You see all the people on Facebook congratulating you after you made that joke? I did. See that. <laughs> they, were, they were ready. Not, Should have made a registry. It's Canadian. <laughs> Those jokes spiral Classic out of control. Yeah. You have to <laughs> deep fake a toddler. Trust me, I've been there. I get it. And in Christmas treason news, <laughs> I'm not saying arson is okay. In, in fact, interesting start. It, it, it kind of can't be. Okay. No, no, I'm tired of this lecture, Heath. I get it all so, the time. So, look, here, but here's the thing, though. If it was good, it would just be setting shit on fire. It can't rise to the level of arson unless it's not okay. But. Yeah, okay. There it is. It's way closer to okay than it would normally be if the object of your arson happens to be a garish, 50 foot tall, treeless bramble cone outside of Fox News headquarters in New York City, which was the case right before we started recording last week's show. And we know about it because over the next 36 hours, Fox News devoted approximately as much coverage to it as they would for the first 36 hours of a foreign invasion. (laughs) Tucker Carlson started a show rising up out of a swamp. (laughs) Talking about Red Dawn. He starts doing Colonel Kurtz's (laughs) monologue. A lot of ethnic slurs in that, by the way, in his version. Yeah. Well, so like a normal show, but with the Christmas tree. Right. Thing yeah. No, like added, story. Then he started talk talking about, about Christmas trees. <laughs> what I love so much about this is that this was their code red, right? Like they've been faking persecution for so long. You can see them not knowing how to react when someone actually did a thing to them. Just, right. oh, we don't even have to make up a fake graphic. Right. You can't add <laughs> for realsies this time to your news reporting. Right. So to be clear, this is very much a local like what was up with the traffic in Midtown today kind of news item. Nobody was hurt. And a 49 year old homeless guy was arrested pretty much immediately after. As far as we know right now, the motive seems to be mental illness. So clearly not worthy of national attention, but the literal hours of live coverage that Fox News devoted to it kind of is worthy of that attention. Various hosts throughout the day used it as an example of the lawless chaos on American streets and the inevitable outcome of defunding police departments, which to be clear, New York City has not done. No, no. no. It's like the seventh largest military in the world. Right, yeah, no. (laughs) And it was also offered, of course, as an example of Christian persecution and the seething hatred that liberals have for Christmas. Okay, I see right through this Fox News. This is a typical crisis actor thing. It's crisis actors doing a false flag (laughs) operation. They just want to take away our basic arson freedoms. I know what you're doing. Exactly. Yeah, if you really support freedom, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Madison Cawthorn will light themselves on fire. It's the only way. Exactly. Now, (laughs) if you've seen the video, your first question should be like, how the fuck were they allowed to put that fucking fire hazard in the middle of Manhattan? <laughs> the motherfuckers billowing up a, a pyroclastic cloud. But instead of addressing that, all the commentary was this comically over the top, woe is meest defiance. Todd Pirro called it, quote, what happens when you have a lawless city? Brian Kilmeade wondered aloud, quote, how soon till this psycho is out again to burn someone else's tree down, end quote. What? Yeah, but my favorite quote was from Fox and Friends co-host <laughs> Ainsley Earnhardt, who said, and I'm not sure if I can even sarcastically quote this without a chorus of strings rising up in the background, but I'll try. Quote, so sad. No more music. No more tree. It's a tree that unites us. It brings us together. It's about the Christmas spirit. It's about the holiday season. It's about Jesus. It's about Hanukkah. 
Okay. It's about really everything <laughs> we stand for uh, as a country. <laughs> Trail cool. Jewish thing. Glory to the new horn Also Jews, I guess. Okay. <laughs> okay, wait. I hate to agree with Ainsley Earhart. The Fox News Christmas tree engulfed in flames does really accurately represent what I stand for. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, look, Tucker Carlson wasn't tied to it at the time, but that's a nine out of no, ten okay. for what Eli oh, stands for. I think you're you're allowed to do that arson by Rifra. Like you, Eli Bosnick, would oh, have been allowed that's, that's to do true. that. That's true. That's so, true. Yeah. So much more sincere than anything else going on in that building. I hold that same belief. Thank you. So, yes, the war on Christmas has reached your doorstep, Fox News, and not your nativity scene nor your mistletoe should be spared from our unholy wrath, yada, yada, yada. But I have to add this one last detail because it's so fucking delicious. In the midst of this, again, 36-hour blitzkrieg of alarmist nonsense over a mentally ill homeless guy with fucking matches, they repeatedly used a background graphic that read, and I quote, the left wants you to be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> we do. I want them to be afraid. Well, that's I true. Do. Yeah, that's I fair. want them to be afraid that this is actually a homeless guy that we hired, but he's not really, but he's an operative. That's what <laughs> yeah. I want them to think. Right. Yeah. That is what they think. <laughs> Good. There you go. Nailed it. Mission accomplished. <laughs> and in Lizard of Oz news. If you were trying to think of human beings who have done the most harm to public health and safety over the past decade... Dr. Mehmet Oz is almost certainly in your top five. Yeah. This pseudoscience pushing, astrology endorsing quack has pushed out more misinformation than a Trump era press secretary. And now, because he's going for some kind of evil triple crown, I guess, he's running for the GOP nomination for senator in Pennsylvania. But Christians aren't sold, not because of that pseudoscience lying bad shittery. It's because he's kind of Muslim me. Yeah. Kind of Muslim me. Yep. <laughs> no, okay. I get what you're saying, but pseudoscience lying bat shittery, that's a pretty solid TLDR for the Quran <laughs> and the Bible <laughs> and just about every holy book I'm aware of. Yeah. Being genuinely religious is definitely suspect when I'm evaluating a candidate for office, for sure. Fair. Counterpoint we get a few Muslims working in the Capitol building. That's all the more often Marjorie Taylor. Green preemptively dives under her desk. So yeah, so pros and cons. Yeah. Pros and she's cons. not there um, under looking. my system either. But yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's true. That's yeah. yeah. So the source of this suspicion comes from an article on Charisma News titled "Why Christians Should Be Leery of This Celebrity 2022 Senatorial Candidate." They make no mention of his pseudoscientific pursuits, except they, they do mention that he supported hydroxychloroquine as a cure for COVID. Did he? But I'm pretty sure they mean that as a good thing. So, <laughs> no, sure instead, they, they spend the entire article mentioning that he was raised Muslim three times in 425 words. Oh, Jesus Christ. So how fucked up is it that we've even reached a point where celebrity candidate isn't considered sufficient reason to be leery of them? Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's and terrifying. While the Charisma article does begrudgingly admit that he's a Christian now because of his wife, that doesn't stop them from shitting on his church for being all hippy-dippy and welcoming. Quote, the church's website says it's an open-minded, forward-looking Christian church, drawing its faith from the Bible as illuminated by the teachings of Emmanuel Swedenborg, 1688 to 1772. If you have serious questions about traditional Christian theology, yet wish to explore the deeper aspects of the Bible and the Christian faith, we <laughs> may be what you're looking for. Hold on. The accidental use of yet there is so very telling. <laughs> if you have serious questions about Christian theology, yet you still want to be Christian. <laughs> you know, it's way too honest by accident. I love that. Yeah. Continuing the quote. We worship a God of unconditional love whose warmth and light can deepen your inner life and give direction to your spiritual journey, end quote. And you can just tell by putting that quote in the article, the authors at Charisma want the Raiders to be like, well, that doesn't sound like no Christianity to me. Right. Yes, yep. exactly. 
I just I, I love though that they, they're claiming to be a forward-looking church that's based on a 250-year-old theological interpretation. <laughs> Jesus, J- Jumbo <laughs> shrimp has nothing on religion. I don't even know no, why we use not. that as an exemplar. <laughs> yeah, they literally have the year 1688 to 1772 written down, and then they're like, "We're the future. Yep. We are the future. Very modern. <laughs> <laughs> We're the bleeding edge." <laughs> One other thing. They also warn readers that he practices transcendental meditation and Reiki, which are, you know, not from the United States, adding almost, <laughs> quote, also his dad was a Muslim, a muslim Muslim. So, yeah, I think we all know what we need to do. Convince a bunch of Americans that Trump is a Muslim by 2024. We know how easily they fall for Photoshop. Get on it, people. We go. can do this. There yeah, it's just a Sharpie. So easy. <laughs> And finally tonight, a Catholic diocese in Italy is dealing with a severe irony crisis this week after Bishop Antonio Stagliano went to a holiday festival and told an audience full of kids that Santa Claus is not real. (laughs) So now the diocese is doing its best to explain that it's super mean to point out the fakeness of the fake thing that people believe in. Except you have to eventually tell them because otherwise that that's crazy. You have to tell them about the fake thing. But if you do it too early and the people are extremely childish, you might make them cry and then fuck you. I did hear it. Yes, I did hear it. Fuck <laughs> you. Okay. I'm just saying a man in a golden hat should never try to disabuse anybody of anything. <laughs> Those Jenga blocks are right underneath you, my dude. Oh, yeah. Right underneath yeah. you. Yeah. But okay, but for real though, of all the reasons that Italian bishops have ever made a bunch of kids cry, this is the best one, right? We yep. shouldn't lose track of that. Yep. This is good news. Yes, it is. So <laughs> here's what the bishop said at the festival last week. He's got a big hall full of kids, and he's supposed to be given just like a basic talk about beautiful traditions of Christmas or whatever. But he clearly got all worked up about how all these bullshit kids aren't taking it fucking seriously and how it's getting too commercialized and Starbucks and their slur word Jew cups. So he went (laughs) rogue and he launched into a crazy angry speech about how they stole the Christ from Christmas. And then right before one of his wranglers was able to tackle him away from the podium, the bishop snuck this out at the last second. Quote, no, Santa Claus does not exist. In fact, I would add that the red of the suit he wears was chosen by Coca-Cola exclusively for advertising purposes. <laughs> blah, 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 tackle. <laughs> An inaccuracy that's not just the first result when you Google it, yeah. but that result is on Coca-Cola's website. They're like, no, guys, we <laughs> didn't that's give not, we, it would be It would be good for us. We would probably want that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I, I, I get it, Bishop Stagliano. I, I really do. I've been there. But seriously, just, just relax your eyes. <laughs> right, that was a very narrow joke. Mostly that was a joke for Heath, but That's everyone can have it. You know what? There's no Easter Bunny. <laughs> yeah, just a guy in a suit. So, in response to all that, all of Italy was like, dude, what the fuck is wrong with you? What are you doing, man? <laughs> so, the diocese had him do an interview with La Repubblica to explain himself and apologize to, to all of Italy and all the kids. And the interview started with the question, dude, what the fuck is wrong with you, man? What are you doing? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Bishop Stagliano answered, I did not tell the kids that Santa Claus doesn't exist. Yes, you literally did. did. I just read the quote. You literally said those exact words. And then he looked directly at me, Heath Enright, and added, but we talked about the need to distinguish what is real from what is not. Oh, (laughs) quote. I have follow-up questions, man in a dress and a hat of gold. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, interview thing obviously didn't work out, and the church had to issue an apology that explained how Bishop Stagliano isn't physically capable of delivering the apology that he definitely has in his heart, but he just, he just can't do it. Hmm. But that didn't really work either. Some extra crazy Catholic people actually did applaud the bishop for putting the Christ back in Christmas, which is more important than not making hundreds of little kids start crying and ruining (laughs) the holiday. But pretty much all the other Catholic people went on big rants that further exposed the insane hypocrisy of their whole thing. It was mostly parents being like, 
you guys are killing us over here. The pandemic sucks. Our kids are all depressed. We can't get a vaccine because you said it's made, you said it's made of like a Dutch baby from 1972. I don't even know what that means, but we can't get a vaccine now. And now some creepy celibate guy with no family is telling my kid there's no Santa. Why do we have creepy celibate guys in charge of stuff in the first? Fuck, what's going on? So that was like the general response from Italian Catholicism. I, I mean, maybe it's good. Yeah, maybe maybe they'll hear it, but yeah, probably not. I don't know. Either way. I'm stealing Christmas and I'm having an ice cold can of Coke right now in celebration. <laughs> yeah. Secular Santa Christmas check. There you go. All right. Well, Heath is back on the Coke. That means it's probably time to close the headlines down. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. You guys want to get some more Coke? And when we come back, <laughs> Andrew Torres will be here to talk about a different group of terrifying religious people in robes. Holy shit, it's almost the holidays. And Movement, the original watch brand to break all the rules, started by two college dropouts who didn't want to overpay for a nice watch, has you covered. You bet your f***ing ass it does. Now they're bringing you the sleekest, most quality gifts of the season with hundreds of watches, sunnies, and fine jewelry styles to choose from. Stuff your stockings, impress your family, wow your partners, or treat yourself because we know you're dressing up too with the perfect gift from f- movement well sh- directly into my mouth and f- penguin that sounds f- awesome heath you can f- a f- by those words you f- and f- nugget and movement is making it easy beautiful curated gift boxes his and her gift guides and free and quick shipping right to your door just in time for the holidays i got my mom's fiance the f- dune mother f- taupe for his f- gobbling f- fisting birthday this year f- nice and he f- loved it f- inside a f- weasel f- be the big winner this holiday season with a gift from movement go to movement.com slash scathing that's m-v-m-t dot com slash scathing and join the movement movement watches they probably shouldn't have told us it was okay to swear in the copy their watches really are lovely though. yeah those generally nice watches Mung f- You know, when you're drowning, it's easy to overlook the fact that you're bleeding to death. And the fact that that's the best analogy I can come up with for a segment about the Supreme Court tells you a lot about where we are these days. See, as focused as we've been on the upcoming dismemberment of abortion rights, it's easy to overlook the ongoing evisceration of the Establishment Clause. But it looks like the high court is about to take another significant step towards theocracy in the case of Carson v. Macon. And to help us get our heads around that one, I'm excited to welcome back co-host of the Opening Arguments podcast and clean up on aisle 45, Andrew Torres. Andrew, welcome back. Uh, th- thanks for that intro, Noah. <laughs> you know, someday I'm going to have you on because the Supreme Court did something right. I swear. Right. I promise. <laughs> we call that 2015. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, you know, always, always a pleasure to be on, even if the reasons, therefore, are are less than uh, desirable. How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing I'm doing uh, good, all things considered. So let's take a look at this one. The, the question at the heart of this case is about state funding for religious schools. So before we get into the specifics, I want to establish where we are now and how we got there, because I feel like a lot mm. of listeners are under the naively optimistic impression that giving tax dollars to religious schools was just like already unconstitutional all by itself. But but that's not the case, correct? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that that position, although it is the position, if if you care, that was subscribed to by a super majority of the founding fathers, for some reason, our heavily originalist Supreme Court does not care at all about that fact hmm. when uh, when evaluating the First Amendment right now. That position which also happens to be my position, seems to me to be the very clear, bright line as to how governments may assist churches and religious institutions without running afoul of the First Amendment would be totally okay for, you know, the fire department to put out a fire at your local church. Totally not okay to take your tax dollars put them in a bag, then reach into the bag and grab that money and hand it over to the church. 
This was such a non-controversial opinion that uh, 37 states amended their constitution in the 19th century to make that explicitly clear that that also violated the policy at the state level. Right? You know, this is this this used to not be a difficult position to argue. It has, as I said, zero votes on the Supreme Court right now. Wow. There is a proposition that has, as far as I can tell, one vote on the Supreme Court. That's one I have explained on the show before, and that is called the Lemon Test. Mm -hmm. And the Lemon Test comes from a Supreme Court case called Lemon versus Kurtzman. And the idea is that it's set forth a three-prong test to determine if a particular policy violates the Establishment Clause. And a policy must meet all three of these prongs in order to be constitutional, right? So number one, it must not have the primary purpose of advancing or inhibiting religion, right? It can't be intended to be a thumb on the scale for religion. Number two, it must not have the primary effect of advancing or inhibiting religion. And number three, it must not excessively entangle the government with religion. As I've said, that that vote has, uh, as far as I can tell, one vote on the Supreme Court right now. It is it is more expansive, right? It would allow government to give some money to churches, but not enough that, you know, it it kind of made a difference. Mm. In 2002, the Supreme Court took on a case called Zellman versus Simmons Harris, which involved a Cleveland's school vouchers program, which is a direct effort to take money out of state and local tax dollars and give it away to churches. And inexplicably, the Supreme Court said, yeah, that's totally fine. That was a school vouchers program. And uh, how that was squared with the lemon test is don't ask, uh, you know, don't, don't ask, don't tell, don't look too closely. That position, I think, has three votes on the Supreme Court right now, right? And and when I and when I'm counting up the votes, I, I want you to understand the one vote that we know that we have for the lemon test, right? Not even historical separation of church and state is Justice Sotomayor, right? Mm-hmm. She was in the dissent in the uh, Trinity Lutheran case, which which we're about to discuss, and. People forget that 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 was a 7-2 case. The other justice in dissent was Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is no longer on the court. Kagan and Breyer joined with the Howler Monkeys in that. So we have, you know, it's sort of easy to say, uh, you know, a 6-3 conservative Supreme Court. But on religious freedom issues, it's 8-1. And that's, that's really, really a terrible starting point. And then I just alluded to, to the Trinity Lutheran decision. That was, we've, talked about this at length on my show, on your show, in the atheist community, but that was, for some reason, it was unconstitutional discrimination. It violated the free exercise clause yeah. for the state of Missouri to say that a program for repaving children's playgrounds uh, could not exclude exclusively Christian schools. That was a case that I was really confident would go the other way because the facts were so bad. And I uh, uh, was <laughs> I was wrong for not the first and not the last time. OK, so let me just offer sort of the, the layman's understanding on both of those. So as I understand it, the justification, you know, such as it is in the Zellman v. Simmons Harris case was all about how every dollar is voluntary all along this, you know, every step of the way. That was the, sort of the fig leaf that they put over that. Mm-hmm. And the fig leaf over Trinity Lutheran was the idea that the money wasn't going to the religious parts of this church, <laughs> right. but rather the secular parts. Right. Is that accurate? You have you have correctly stated the arguments for the other side. Yes. <laughs> OK, so so we're tearing away those fig leaves is the key here, I think. So I, and, and I realize what a bizarrely eclectic panoply of expertise I expect of you. So apologies in advance for this one. But what can you tell me about rural schooling in Maine? Weirdly, I can tell you an awful lot, uh, and I should not be able to do this. The reason that folks like me are delving into what the structure of Maine's public schooling is like is because, as a spoiler, the very best that I think we can hope for as an outcome in in this case, right? 
Carson versus Macon, is an incredibly narrow ruling that is tailored to the specific idiosyncrasies of what life is like in Maine. So what's life at like in Maine? This is kind of weird to think about because, you know, you sort of chalk up Maine's electoral votes for the Democrats. Uh, a, not not true, right, that there's a yeah. uh, congressional district that's gone for Trump in the past two elections. They occasionally elect lunatic governors. Maine is a very, very small state in terms of population, but a relatively large state in terms of geography, right? So it's, uh, there, there are no cities in Maine. And uh, yeah, don't send us hate mail, right? We, <laughs> all right, Bangor, like we love you. But like, look, right? <laughs> there are towns, but yeah. Right. There, there, there are towns in Maine. Maine is, as they describe themselves in their brief to the Supreme Court, a lightly populated, predominantly rural state. What that means is, there are less than 180,000 kids in public school in the entirety of the state of Maine. Okay. That's not a lot of kids, right? They are governed by 260 different school districts, which for reasons that none of us could possibly care about are called SAUs, right? And here's the unique fact, right? And that is that roughly half of those SAUs, right? Those school districts, do not have the population or the tax revenues to support operating a public high school in that school district, right? Gotcha. So, and this is the, if you take only one thing away from this entire interview, this is the one that I want you to bold underline. In a policy that has been in existence since 1980, right? A policy that predates Pac-Man and the Commodore 64, right? Right. <laughs> The state legislature of Maine looked at the problem and said, well, we can't have like half of our kids not graduate from high school. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a tax subsidy program that says if you live in a school district that does not operate a high school, okay, and only if you live in one of those school districts, then we will give you tax credits to attend a private school in that school district, right? But again, only if you're in one that doesn't have a public school, because in that case, the private school is essentially taking the place of having, a, you know, of, of, of having us have to build things we can't afford, which include a separate public high school in that particular district. And because, of course, in order to qualify, that public school has to be a non-sectarian, right? Religiously neutral, does not teach creationism, does not teach that the earth is 6,000 years old, like, right? Like, it's got to be a replacement for the public school system. And that system in Maine has worked for 40 years, okay? But... Just like, you know, drumming up conservative activists to go in to challenge the handgun ban in the District of Columbia, which had been in place for about 40 years at that time when they, you know, dug up the guy in uh, D.C. versus Heller. Mm. Heller, I believe, was his name. Mm. <laughs> conservative activists have looked at Maine and gone, OK, well, you know, now the only thing that's different, right? Like the reliance interests are the same. The state of Maine seems to be super happy with this outcome, right? But what's different is we got a whole bunch of conservative activists on the Supreme Court. So now, 41 years later, we're going to challenge that policy as discriminating against parents who live in one of those school districts but want to send their kid to the creationist school instead of to the local private but non-sectarian school. So that's this case. And by the way, every case that every court that has heard this has been like, get, get out of here. Right. That's my legal opinion. Yeah. So, yeah, right. Basically, every every lower court understands constitutionality better than the Supreme Court at this point, more or less. So, yeah, go figure. So for the listeners that don't follow the court as closely as me and certainly don't follow it as closely as you, where are we in, in terms of the process on this case? Yeah. So this is a super easy case. It was <laughs> it was brought at the trial court level uh, and the trial court said there is very, very clear governing precedent here from the Supreme Court. And that case is a case called Locke versus Davey from 2004. And. You, I'm sure, will remember this, but some of the our, our listeners may also remember this. 
Locke versus Davy was the reason I was confident Trinity Lutheran was going to go the other way, mm -hmm. right? This was a 7-2 decision from 2004. It's a Rehnquist decision, right? Like, again, not, not, not a, you know, crazy liberal nut job, right? Like, this was the Supreme Court saying that a Washington program that publicly funded scholarships for, for kids to go to college could reasonably exclude those who would use their scholarship on pastoral ministries, right? So that was the issue at Locke, in Locke versus Davy, and, and the state of Washington was like, look, we only have so much money to go around. We want to foster public education. We certainly do not want to discriminate in favor of religion. So what we're going to say is you can use our Washington state public scholarships on anything you want, so long as you don't use it on worshipful theology and pastoral ministries. By the way, actual language from that decision, right? Like mm -hmm. it was, don't take public tax dollars and use them in a way that is narrow sectarian, right? And sectarian is the religious equivalent of partisan, right? Like it, it is not just religious, but like only a specific subset of that. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. It's not like studying the history of religion was yeah. excluded. Yeah. Yeah, that, or, or philosophy of religion. Right. That would have been, all of those would have been perfectly fine. And and again, that principle, it, it, I, I struggle for words for this because these are free exercise cases, right? Like we began kind of with, in making reference to the lemon test, where we should be on this, which is, is it permissible, right? Like if, yeah. if the Washington state scholarship had gone the other way, is it permissible for the state of Washington to take your tax dollars and give it to a kid who's going to give it to a theology, uh, you know, to a, a, a seminary for a degree in worshipful theology? And the answer to that should be no. The answer to that at our current Supreme Court level is not, not only yes, that's fine, right? Zelman versus Simmons Harris. Is it permissible to take public tax dollars and give it to a school that teaches creationism. According to Zelman versus Simmons Harris, the answer to that is yes, that's ridiculous. We should be fighting on that, that turf. We're not, we've got to give up that battleground for now. Now they're asking the opposite, which is, is it permissible to, for a state, for the people in a state to get together and go, uh, come on, please don't take our tax dollars and give it over to the Institute for Creation Research? And there are, as far as I can tell, six votes on the Supreme Court, Jesus. maybe as many as eight for no, that you're being unfair to religious people if you draw that line. And, um, yeah, your, uh, your, your muttered exclamation under the breath is uh, the minimum response that's appropriate. Well, so and, and let's be super clear about what we're talking about, because we're not talking about a school that just, you know, has a religion class in addition to all the other like we're, we're talking about schools that like it, it, in this in this case in Maine in this this particular case some of the schools that are suing are schools that teach that homosexuality is evil that they wouldn't hire gay teachers they teach creationism that's what they're talking about giving state tax dollars to yeah the two schools and again i'm going to read directly from the supreme court briefs here right so the two schools at issue are Bangor Christian Schools, right? Among BCS's educational objectives are to one, lead each unsaved student to trust Christ as his, her personal savior, and then follow Christ as Lord of his or her life. Two, develop within each student a Christian worldview and Christian philosophy of life. Three, prepare each student for the important position in life of spiritual leadership in the school, home, church, community, state, nation, and the world. God, math didn't even make the fucking list, huh? No, no. <laughs> yeah, you, you might think, but no. To be a teacher at Bangor Christian Schools, one must affirm that he or she is a born-again Christian who knows the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Every employee must be born again and must be an active tithing member. I like that they audit you, right? Of a Bible-believing church, oh. <laughs> BCS will not hire teachers who identify as a gender other than on their original birth certificates, nor will it hire homosexual teachers. Now, again, that comes directly from the briefs, right? I would have put that a little differently, but that wow. that is undisputed what BCS, Bangor Christian Schools, stands for. Temple Academy, 
is an integral ministry and a, an extension of the Center Point Community Church. Its governing body is Center Point's Board of Deacons. TA will not admit a child who lives in a two father or two mother family. Jesus Christ. TA will not admit a student who is homosexual, though there are students presently enrolled who, quote, struggle with homosexuality. A child who identifies with a gender that is different than what is listed on the child's original birth certificate would not be eligible for admission. I, I, I could go through, but uh, yeah, these are, you know, disciples of Ken Ham. These are young earth creationist, hardcore, fundamentalist, anti-LGBTQ nightmare schools. And the question is not... Can your tax dollars be given to them? The answer to that's already yes, right? And we can talk about what you can do about that. The answer is must your yeah. tax dollars be given to them? And this Supreme Court is on a collision course with yes, you must fund these schools with your tax dollars. And if you would ask, hey, how might Alexander Hamilton feel about that? Uh, go fuck yourself. <laughs> so. All right. So maybe this is just stupidly, naively hopeful in the assumption that, you know, a rule might apply to a fucking religious institution. But couldn't the legislators in Maine just craft a new law that says, OK, it can be religious, but you have to hire gay people like wouldn't like it, by giving them this the state grant money? Could that force these religious schools to abide by all of the if you receive state tax money, you must X type of regulations? Yeah, so A, that would almost certainly run afoul of RIFRA, and B, this Supreme Court is doing its best to roll back Employment Division versus Smith and read RIFRA back into the Constitution as currently understood. So, yeah, I mean, what would happen is if if the Supreme Court says, uh, sorry, you've got to include crazy creationist academy number seven on your list of approved schools, the main legislature meets and says, all right, any school receiving tax dollars must, you know, abide by the main human uh, human rights law, which, among other things, prevents discrimination in hiring, firing on the basis of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity. Right. They could pass that law. And then Crazy Creationist Academy number seven would just petition for a reasonable accommodation to the law to uh, comport with its sincerely held belief that, you know, gay people are icky. Wow. All right. So I guess the, the real question here, because as I said before the record, I think a lot of this and the reason why I wanted to really highlight this case is because there's a death by a thousand cuts thing happening to the separation of, of church and state. And I think the most important question now is where on the slippery slope are we? Right. Like, granted, we're going to fall into nicely mulched tires at the bottom. But but assuming that the court <laughs> overturns this law, like what's the next step in the Liberty Council playbook? Yeah, the next step is explicitly overturning, you know, having as the question presented on certiorari to the Supreme Court be that the, the Supreme Court erred and should revisit and reverse its decision in Employment Division versus Smith, that, you know, notoriously leftist Antonin <laughs> Scalia opinion. Mm -hmm. And so we will be left with the de facto incorporation of RIFRA into the First Amendment as a constitutional right. And then the next step from there is uh, a, a direct endorsement of the principle that, by the way, as far as I can tell, has a majority of votes already on the Supreme Court. And that is the accommodationist viewpoint of the separation of church and state. And that and that view is that what separation of church and state means is that government may not prefer one particular sect or branch of Christianity to another. It may nevertheless generally prefer religion to irreligion as a neutral matter. All right. So at the risk of setting you up with an answerless question here, other than like talking Supreme Court justices into taking up dangerous hobbies like bungee jumping, <laughs> what can we as activists do to mitigate this trend? Well, at the risk of losing both of us some patrons, <laughs> uh, let me monologue and soapbox for about 30 seconds here, right? This is a binary 
existential question, right? Lots of Democrats are not great on church state separation, right? Stephen Breyer, not great on the separation of church and state. Nevertheless, every single Republican is aligned with, if not personally, a theocrat. And so what you can do is get out and vote for Democrats, even when they disappoint you, even when they don't live up to abolishing all student loans or, you know, whatever else is on your pet list of things that you and I would like Joe Biden to do. But here's here's the reality of the situation. We are at the precipice, right? If 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 the numbers that are where they are now continue into 2022, we will lose the Senate. Mitch McConnell has then said that he will hold no more judicial hearings from 2022 to 2024. And that means that they will steal Stephen Breyer's Supreme Court seat if uh, he has an actuarially approved incident over the next two and a half years. It means that we will do nothing to fill the seats that are open, thus magnifying the likelihood that you get a Trump appointed judge at any level of the federal court. And if that isn't an existential enough risk for you to get out and vote for the worst, the most terrible, the most hidebound conservative Democrat, I, I really don't know what to tell you, right? Like it, it is, it, 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 the Republicans have figured this out and we haven't, uh, our, uh, you know, Joe Biden's approval rating is 43% right now. And so if you're asking yourself like, well, I would just do this if only Joe Manchin would blow up the filibuster, like, you know, (laughs) as political scientist, if you're surveying the landscape, there is not a huge groundswell consensus to give Democrats more power to do the stuff they're doing, right? It's the opposite of that. Yeah. It's a 43% approval rating. The Democrats who have hung together are, you know, risking electoral backlash and, you know, to to expect sort of more profiles and courage out of them, I think, is um, not consonant with electoral reality. So, uh, yeah, 2022 is going to be real bad and you're going to have to suck it up and vote blue anyway. And if you don't, this situation, I, I kind of have. Have you seen the new uh, uh, Foundation uh, series on, I, I on Apple TV? No. Oh, you should. Anyway, but I know you've read the original, right? Mm-hmm. And so the idea is, right, Asimov's grand conceit was to take what would be 30,000 years of chaos, barbarian wandering in the wilderness and shrink it down to a mere thousand years until you could reimpose civilization. That's kind of where I am with the Supreme Court right now, right? Like it's going to be really, really terrible for a long, long time. And the question is, can we shrink it down to a manageable number of years or are we going to expand it and make it worse? And um, I know you don't want to hear that, but uh, you know, that's you have me on to tell the hard truth. So there you go. Well, and and I thank you for for telling us the truth, regardless of how hard it is. And of course, if you'd like Andrew's help sorting out uh, the other crazy shit going on with the courts, <laughs> be sure to check out Opening Arguments, uh, which we'll have linked on the show notes. And believe it or not, not all of it is depressing as all fuck. Sometimes they talk about Transformers and 80s cartoons and shit. So uh, yeah. if you haven't checked it out already, <laughs> be sure to check it out. And Andrew, thank you again so much. Oh, no. Thank you so much for having me on. I, I, I love coming on the show. I'm, I'm sorry that I have to come on under these circumstances. Before we put the lid back on this week, I wanted to let you know that if you just can't get enough of me in your life, you can hear me opine on all things Legend of Zelda this week on the Chat of the Wild podcast, which you'll find linked on the show notes. Had a ton of fun with those guys, and we ended up covering a broad range of topics, but mostly Zelda related stuff. Anyway, that's all the blast movie we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptic Red, debuting at 7 Eastern on Monday, an even new episode of our sister show's hot friend, God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday, and an even new episode of our half sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, this episode wouldn't be worthy of a title if I neglected to thank Keith Enright for being my beau, Eli Bosnick for all his great ribbon. I want to thank Andrew Torres for being so gifted. I also want to thank the lovely and talented Lucinda Illusions, who will be back next week and misses you terribly. Also want to thank Kevin from the Not Your Grandmother's Book Club podcast for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. Haven't checked it out, but it sounds a lot like god-awful movies for books. 
That sounds good. Uh, you'll find it linked in the show notes. If you're entertained by other people's masochism, you should check it out. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most marvelous mammals, Keith, Alex, Genji, Leo, Ruth, other Alex, Todd, and Matthew. Keith, Alex, and Genji, who are so smart, Siri asks them shit. Leah, Ruth, and other Alex, who are so sexy, their driver's license are rated R. And Todd and Matthew, who can't jack off onto anything because their jizz always burns up in re-entry. Together, these eight amiable atheists stated our aims to alienate Abrahamic A. Holery this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give us money, especially this time of year, but if you want to make our holidays merry and bright, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash atheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode. Or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but not in a money giving way. Be sure to leave us a five star review. Tell a friend about the show and follow at PIAT Pod on Twitter. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. Sorry, I have not read the ads. Really? Just uh, don't worry about it. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.